thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for the sponsors uh, as well. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to actually be here. It's a really beautiful campus and excellent uh, uh, facilities. I'm actually quite envious of the technology as well. So. <laughs> uh, which reminds me, maybe I should uh, make use of something when I can. Can I do it over here and show them up there or not? No. Just in case. Uh, if, if, if I need to do that. Uh, so, uh, the title of the talk is uh, Transforming Genetic Medicine After Avicenna, Medical Commentaries and the Development in Pulse and Humoral Theory. Uh, now, some of these uh, may be familiar to people, some of it may not be. Uh, the years, 1200 to 1560, probably should be, uh, of, the, of the Common Era. And uh, most of the time, when you'll probably come across that those years, well, unless you've taken courses with Alan uh, and others over here, uh, but if you look at 121560 and see the phrase developments or something that is important happening, that would seem, I would say, contradictory to many of you, probably even myself, before working on this stuff, right? Because we tend to think about this period as, oh, nothing's happening there. Those are the dark ages, right? I mean. Uh, uh, people are doing whatever it is, uh, uh, weighing uh, women up against uh, ducks to determine, right, that scene from uh, Holy Grail, if I were to use that, uh, for witchcraft kind of things, right? Or um, for those who may have gone a bit further, they're like, oh, the Islamic world, yeah, some kind of golden age, but 1200, that's after it, right? Things must be going downhill. What do you mean, uh, development? Similarly, Galen is a big authority in medicine, humoral theory. Um, uh, of course, uh, prominently associated with that Greek past, Hippocratic Hellenic Humoral Theory, uh, four fluids um, uh, in terms of how to understand it, blood, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, black bile. Uh, but often it's seen as, oh yeah, nothing really happened until we got people like, you know, Harvey and then beyond to really uh, get past that kind of medicine. Uh, as if nothing changed in the medieval period. So uh, that's basically what I'm going to go about uh, doing, is try to challenge uh, some of these claims. And to give you a sense on how deeply entrenched and serious about it these claims are, it's not just the popular discourse, it's in the academic discourse. Uh, right? So I'll just give you examples. Another one I didn't bring up was commentaries. Right? Oftentimes people like commentaries. They ossify knowledge. What do you mean they're developments in uh, commentaries, right? Aren't you supposed to be just explaining something else in a text? Not generating new language, uh, new knowledge, sorry. And here you see two uh, 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 quotes. One is from 2011 in the Oxford, uh, what was it, the Encyclopedia of History of Medicine or something of that order, right? It's a, a pretty kind of a large uh, project uh, written by a person who actually works on the Islamic world, but more so in the later period, 17th, 18th century, Ibrahim Najab, who says, commentary in the Islamic medical literature was a style and method of writing rather than a method for providing critical work. Right. And then you get uh, someone like uh, Flores Golan, um, who is, uh, just to put it in perspective, the history of science society, uh, issues what is probably the top journal in the history of science uh, un for these days, unfortunately named Isis, uh, but of course named after the, the Greek goddess Isis, uh, not, not after the current ones. Uh, and uh, uh, he's the editor of that journal, right? So just to give you a sense, and he goes, yeah, as in the Greek aftermath, commentaries were heaped upon commentaries, incidentally producing finds of great promise, yet in the grand scheme of things, leading to unredeemed ossification. Same claim, uh, right? So, th so this is not just popular discourse. This is much more prevalent. In terms of medicine, never going beyond Galenic medical theory. Uh, you know, 1930s. That maybe sounds reasonable for someone to claim that. Back in the 30s, right? Max Meyerhoff, actually uh, a really great historian of medicine, also a practicing physician, lived in Egypt for a long time, was German, uh, and brought to light actually the guy I work most on, Ibn Nafis, uh, to the broader audience, uh, right, to talk about it. No, this guy in the 1280s really did do something novel, right? Actually, so. Uh, but of course he says, the theory and the thought of the Greeks were left untouched and treasured up after careful systematization. Uh, fast forward till 2003, reprinted in 2010, a leading scholar of history of science and Islamic uh, society and also <laughs> philosophy, Dimitri Gutas, professor now retired from Yale. Credentials, right? Um, nevertheless, it is also clear that the Arabic medicine ultimately never went beyond Galenism. And he says, he actually then provides a reason, and he says that that's because philosophy and medicine sort of 
parted or physicians uh, as physicians could not challenge philosophical principles and medical theory was considered as something that came out of philosophical principles right so that's what his argument is um, in 2013 Emily Savitt Smith uh, member of the British Academy a fellow of the British Academy right extremely phenomenal scholar of Islamic medicine Right, said something similar, uh, that the notion of four bodily humors was one of the unchallenged scientific or medical ideas that were universally assimilated with little or no challenge throughout the Islamic world. Now, I'll directly show you how some of the work uh, that I'm doing uh, goes against that, right? But so that just gives you a perspective on, on the... Ibn Nafis, the person I just briefly brought up, is most associated with uh, talking about the pulmonary transit of blood prior to uh, anyone else and challenging Galen's view that the heart septum wall is porous. Right? So Galen had maintained that the blood got from the right side to the left side of the heart because there are pores in the heart uh, septum wall, but he said very clearly invisible pores because he was, he did perform in, uh, dissections, he actually did observe hearts and he's like, yeah, there are these big pits, they don't seem to open up into anything, but they must, right, is the way he kind of had it phrased. And Ibn Nafis was the first guy to turn around and say, he goes, there are no visible pores and there are no invisible pores, right? And he turns around and says, blood actually goes to the lungs and from there makes its way into it. Now, not all of it, not every part of it, etc., but at least got that part going. Um, this has been known since Max Meyerhoff in the 1930s. Uh, right, the same guy I just quote, uh, had a quote from earlier. But subsequently people are like, yeah, no one really picked this up, right? No one was really interested in Ibn Nafis' views, and of course they've got very many reasons uh, to claim about it, right? Uh, he says, well, one guy, uh, Ullman, again a very famous historian of Islamic medicine, says, well, that's because he didn't actually do systematic physiological research. Somehow he just guessed at this by looking at the heart, right? Uh, and he goes, that's why uh, the significance should be borne in mind, because no one actually then worked went any farther with it. Uh, similarly, in 2005, right, this is more a person writing a survey, so he's relying really more on what other people have said, and he speculates, he goes, you know, maybe some obscure manuscript may refer to the curious doctrines of Ibn Nafis, but no real evidence that later authors were interested in anti-Galenic speculations, and that seems to be the dogma running through, that no one's interested in challenging Galen in the Islamic world over the course of at least a thousand year living tradition. Right? Uh, that somehow no one really thought about uh, checking some of those things. So, uh, again, in terms of why some people claim that, well, these are some explanations provided. Well, the physician apparently after Avicenna, who was a very famous physician, also a very famous philosopher, Aquinas, in fact, oftentimes when he says, Aristotle says this, he means Avicenna, because that's really how he's getting his Aristotle. Uh, right, for the most part. His main interlocutors are Avicenna and Averroes, both Islamic philosophers. One hailing from Spain, the other one hailing from uh, eastern Iran, right, uh, where Avicenna was from. Uh, so, you know, he's a major philosopher, major, massive physician uh, as well, has this big text called the Canon of Medicine, which was used even in Leiden at least up till the 1700s, I think, as a medical textbook, and in some cases in other parts of Europe even later than that, right? So, um, and Dor uh, Doris Behrens of Safe turns around and says, well, but the physician as this universal scholar, right, and practitioner personified by Avicenna was not valid in this later period, right? After 1200s or so, it's really not valid, right? And that may explain why there is no challenge against Galenic medicine. Right? So this is now people trying to pull at straws in terms of explaining it. No one rejects the fact. Right? They think that it's a fact and, and proceed on. Um, and because, of course, the claim is that there were no developments, well, then anything that we see within the Islamic discourses, so we uh, encounter some new traditions in prophetic medicine, we see some ideas about generation related to contraception and abortion theories and those are, uh, or um, uh, understandings of contraception and abortion and all those kinds of discussions in the Islamic world. And so whenever they come across these phrases, they're like, oh, they're going back to Hippocratic uh, authors or they're going back to Galen. Right? So this is a quote from 1999, Julia Bummel saying the same thing about the concept of semen, etc. And of course, on the other side, the Renaissance. Well, clearly, if the Islamic physicians never did anything, and uh, we certainly know and can name people in the 1500s, some of whom Alan works on, right, who start challenging aspects of Galen, that means these people would have come up with it 
purely based on going back and rereading the Hellenic corpus, that there was nothing really in the Islamic corpus that they could have picked up from, right? And that seems to be also one of these dogmas around. And so Nancy Ceresi, a phenomenal uh, historian of medicine, has this amazing book called Avicenna in Renaissance Italy. So of course, we recognize the importance of Avicenna in Renaissance Italy, but still wanted to maintain that these people are writing commentaries on Avicenna and trying to work within humanistic notions going back to Galen, and that's how they're deriving some of this stuff with no idea that something could have been happening in the Arabic commentaries on Avicenna that were also being produced uh, between 1200 and 1520 when the Renaissance commentaries become massive. So, so this is a kind of larger historiographical picture that we have against <coughs> which my work goes. Uh, it's a large project that I'm working on, and uh, the real the crux of it is challenging this notion that nothing new happened. Right? And again, the claim is made, but it's never really made by systematically examining the commentaries. It's made, it's made based on the fact that these are commentaries that clearly nothing could have happened. That's one way. The other way it's made is, well, because no one came up with the theory of blood circulation. That somehow any medical development beyond Galen has to get to circulation. This has been a much harder issue for historians of science and medicine to deal with, and it's a much larger issue for us to conceptualize too, right? That science does not proceed in a linear path, and it may not actually always progress unidirectionally either. That you can actually move away and move towards some other area, and that would still be productive and scientific, that may not actually be where we end up at a later stage, right? But that's been very hard to fathom in, uh, in history of science and medicine to really struggle with it. And I'd say that's been one of the biggest challenges, right? So once I removed that blinder, and I was like, okay, commentaries may have something of interest, so let's dive into them and start examining them. We'll see what happens, right? Uh, so I'm going to give you some selections on it to show where they challenge Galen. But before that, I also want to introduce you just to the vast circulation of medical knowledge and the kind of expertise that existed. Because the claim is often made, oh, we have these great, you know, universal, erudite scholars such as Avicenna, right? They had strong patronage. They worked in these lavish courts. Uh, they uh, were philosophers, they were trained in philosophy, they were physicians, they were trained in medicine, they were trained in many other sciences, and that somehow later on the physician really wasn't really that big, right? And the people were not trained in, in, in those ways. That seems to be a larger claim. So I'm going to go through seven commentators and show you uh, where they're from, what kinds of roles they had, what kinds of training they had, and also just the vast area that they span and how they are interconnected in terms of with students. So that'll give you an idea about the productivity, right? The number of manuscripts that are generated, the students that they have, how much is being taught, right? So behind each person, there's a slew of their students and their teachers, right? That just gives you an idea about how active these societies are in the process of now knowledge production, right? Is maybe the way to, uh, to phrase it. So my first guy. Fakhreddin al-Razi, right, who died in 1210, uh, is an extremely famous, now well-regarded, and much more work has been done on him over the last three, four decades, right, philosopher, theologian, and, and many other things. He was born in Rai, uh, close to modern-day Tehran in Iran, uh, moves a lot, actually, uh, moves towards the western part of Iran and Azerbaijan in Tabriz, makes it back to Rai at one point, then goes all the way to Bukhara, all right, uh, Central Asia, uh, makes his way then to Herat, modern day Afghanistan, at some point, uh, right, uh, then goes back and forth between the courts in Bukhara and Herat. He actually had two rulers, sets of rulers, who were at war with one another, but fighting against one another also to provide patronage to Fakhreddin al-Razi, right, that's how big he is. Uh, ultimately, the, uh, the Khwarezm Shahs who are in Bukhara, the same ones who let the Mongols in by insulting them, so goes the story, right? Uh, when they beat the people whose court was in Herat, the Hurids, um, they asked Razi to move to Bukhara. He didn't like it there. He wanted to go back to Herat, and they accepted that uh, um, decision of his. Uh, he had a madrasa, right? Basically, which is a school or a college of higher learning at this time. And he had a method where he taught people various sciences, 
religious sciences, and also the philosophical sciences. Right? What's fascinating is that he also wrote a commentary on medicine. Um, he says that on his way from Rai to Bukhara, he stopped in a place called Sarahs, uh, where he met a guy called al sarahsi who was a physician. And he engaged with him in debates in theoretical medicine. Now, theoretical medicine and philosophy are very close. Now, philosophy, I mean by the early period philosophy, so ideas about motion, you know, things that we think now in terms of physics, right, in the classic kind of Aristotelian physics, on which medicine is formed, theory of elements, and those sorts of things. That is part of book one of canon of medicine and the kind of medical theory, right? So he engaged with this physician on those topics and realized, huh, I should write a commentary on Avicenna's book one of medicine, right? And that's exactly what he does. He writes a commentary and he dedicates it to this physician, a Sarasi. So it already gives you this kind of uh, conversation, discussion between physicians and philosophers that is uh, going on in this time period. He had many, many students, um, one of whom came all the way from Morocco, modern day, uh, made his way to Egypt, and then came to study with him. Uh, sadly died uh, when the Mongols invaded, uh, and so uh, died a bit young. Uh, but he still left, he, he too left behind a commentary on the canon. He had many other students who were successful in fleeing the Mongol invasion and made their way westward, right? A number of whose works then are commented upon by later people, right? So this, uh, uh, there'll be too many names, so I'm not naming those people for intent intentionally. Ibn Nafis is just about 70 years later in terms of his death date, of course, but he writes his commentary in the 1240s. We know he's from somewhere around Damascus, not exactly sure where, right? Uh, there is a neighborhood uh, uh, maybe in Qurash or Qush that is close to Damascus. He's probably from there, right? Uh, because he's known as al Qurashi. Um, but he made his way to Cairo at some point. Um, exactly not sure when. Uh, but we do know that there was a massive hospital built in Cairo by the famous Mamluk ruler, uh, Sultan al-Mansur al-Qalawun. And this massive, massive hospital is uh, 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 the institution to which Ibn Nafis donates all of his medical books and all his books before his death. Right. So the ruler was quite particular about who he appointed in very many ways. He was very directly involved in the hospital. So the fact that Ibn Nafis can donate his books at his death or bequeath the books to this hospital suggests he was pretty tight with the ruler, uh, right? Uh, because you just don't do that otherwise. Um, some of his students, those who used to attend his study circles, uh, ended up becoming the first um, uh, physicians, uh, chief physicians of Egypt under Qadabu, right? So that again shows his kind of close connection with rulers. He wrote many, many texts. Uh, he's a physician, he's a jurist, he's a philosopher. He wrote texts in all of those genres, including one also in hadith, prophetic traditions, right? But he's most famous for writing a commentary on all five books of the canon of medicine. He's one of only two people who to ever do that in Arabic, and he was the first one to do it. Uh, it is a lematic commentary, which means that it breaks up the entire uh, canon of medicine, which in its printed version is three volumes, 700 pages each. Right. Uh, he broke that down into what would be called lemmas, right? So the, uh, you know, small, uh, uh, sometimes the lemma can be just a sentence, sometimes a few sentences, right, which are determined as a passage necessary to comment upon. Or all five books, uh, right? And sometimes uh, his explanation of one sentence can go on for an entire manuscript folio, which uh, one of the ones that I use is 27 lines. Uh, and a pretty wide uh, uh, folio, so the 27 lines, each line can probably have about 40, 45 words, right? Uh, and the entire uh, commentary is 600 and something folios, so that means if you turn it around, so it's 1,200 and something pages of 27 lines, right? Uh, so when I say I haven't read significant part of his corpus, you'll know why. Because uh, that's just one of his works. He actually has many other works, right, that he's also written. Um, but they're sitting there, they were used extensively by people, and we'll see it shortly. I'll give you the examples. He also has, or there's a work associated with him called the epitome. Now, it's called the epitome of the canon by some and epitome of medicine by others, because they're not really sure what is it that it is abridging. Is it abridging the canon, or is it abridging kind of, you know, this is an abridged version of, this is all you need to know about medicine. Right? I say it's attributed to him because most of the time it goes against what he says in his larger works. Right? Um, 
that is its own mystery, and I'm still working through what the heck is going on there, right? It didn't seem to throw off too many people who later commentary on this abridged work. So most people after about, uh, what is it, mid-1300s will actually be commenting only on the abridgment, the epitome. The commentaries on the canon start disappearing. Uh, the abridgment now they can actually go the entire way because it abridges all of the five books. It uh, excludes the anatomy, but otherwise abridges all five books. Right? So it makes it easier for people to deal with. Um, this guy I'm just going to quickly glance over. Uh, he is a, he's an absolute contemporary of Ibn Nafis, right? Uh, from similar regions in Damascus. Uh, they probably had the same teachers, so he's a great control for me. It really helps me identify. No, this is Ibn Nafis's novel thing, but because guess what? This guy doesn't have this stuff at the same time, right? So he's my control. Uh, he too moved from Damascus to Halab is what this map shows because it's uh, using 13th century names, Aleppo, right? Uh, and he actually uh, worked at the court of the Ayyubid ruler in Aleppo and dedicated his commentary to him. In his commentary, and I should also mention for Ibn Nafis, both of them use Fakhreddin al-Razi's commentaries. So they already have it. Uh, Ibn Nafis is writing his commentary in 1242. Fakhreddin al-Razi's commentary is from 1180, but he dies 1208 or something. And by 1242, Ibn Nafis is fully conversant with it and is using it as much as he wants. Uh, Samari not only uses uh, Fakhreddin's commentary, but he uses a commentary written by one of his students on the text, too. Right? And also uses a commentary written by his teacher who was responding to that. So you see real kind of engagement going on. That's what I mean, right? For every person I'm throwing out, there's a massive group of people right, involved in the enterprise. Now, because of the Mongol invasion, you can see that for a period, we're going to focus on the west side, because there's a lot of destruction that's happened out of the east, and then it'll take a while for things to go back to east. Right, the next guy I'm looking at is Sukhuddin Shirazi. He's a philosopher, astronomer, physician, wrote massive amounts of texts in very many ways. In astronomy, you'll also come across his name because he does many things which Copernicus then ends up using. Right, um, so he, he has his hands in many ways, uh, uh, in many parts. He moved from Shiraz, southern Iran, one of the cities spared by the Mongol invasion, uh, up to Tabriz, where the Mongols set up their capital. Right, he worked under uh, uh, some figures there. But then he made his way to Sivas in Anatolia uh, against clients of the Mongol state. And then he sent as an official delegation to Egypt to negotiate a peace between the Mongols and the Mamluks. Right? So, and when he's in Egypt, he acquires Ibn Nafis's medical commentary along with a few others. Right. Uh, returns back to Tabriz, and then writes his own commentary on book one of the canon of medicine, which he uh, donate, uh, which he dedicates, sorry, to uh, the vizier of the Mongols. Right. Um, so pretty, pretty high up in, in, in that way. Um, the next guy, Sadid al-Din al-Khazaruni, he's also from Shiraz. He takes pride in the fact that he's from the same locality as Qutbuddin al-Shirazi, actually. Um, he moves to Tabriz at some point. We don't know much about his life. The only part we do know, and the death date is also kind of, you know, not entirely clear. Um, the latter date is probably uh, more defended because of the fact that there is a manuscript sitting in Tabriz, which contains his autograph, stating that he has given permission to a Christian physician by the fascinating name of Galen, Javinus, uh, uh, who has mastered this particular medical work with him. Right. So, so that's why the latter date, uh, and that also told, tells us that he moved to the base at some point, right? Because he's writing that, and that uh, manuscript actually is from a madrasa. So that again gives you a sense that madrasa incorporated medical teaching of some kind, whether in curriculum or just out on the side where people may be assigned. Right? Um, he wrote commentaries on book one of the canon and a commentary in the epitome, and was a practicing physician. Well, right? So the other ones I went through as well, Fakhadin and Razi was not a practicing physician, the remaining three were. Shirazi uh, worked actually in a hospital in Shiraz before um, moving up. Ibn Nafis possibly also worked in hospitals, not entirely clear though, uh, but they're all practicing physicians at this moment, but they're also philosophers uh, because they're very philosophical. Uh, the last three, Jamal al-Din al uh, is from somewhere in southern Anatolia, goes to Cairo to learn, and then comes back. He's actually more of a theologian. Uh, and has a position at the Adinid court in, 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 in Qaraman, in southern Anatolia at the time. Um, but writes this commentary on the epitome, this medical text, right, which he calls the resolution of the epitome. So what you see is, this guy in Anatolia is writing a commentary in a text written by Ibn Nafis, 
allegedly or at least attributed to him, so he knows those works. Kazaruni also writes a commentary of the epitome, so of course he knows them. Both Aksarai and Kazaruni directly rely on Qutbuddin al-Shirazi, so they have his commentary too. Right? I mean, so that's how you get a sense of how these texts are moving and people are actually engaging and, and deeply working with them. Uh, this is a fascinating manuscript of Aksarai. So this is his resolution of the epitome text, which is actually from Herat in Afghanistan, dated 100 years after this guy's death. So this manuscript makes its way from Anatolia all the way to Herat within 100 years. Right. Uh, more importantly, not only does this manuscript make its way there, but this guy, our next guy, Nafis al Nawad al-Kiamani, actually used the resolution to write his own commentary. Because that manuscript that I just showed you, I'll show you later an image, contains marginalia where his students, Kiamani students, turn around and say, oh, our teacher said this. And it comes exactly where, in his commentary, he's basically added material on top of Aksai's commentary. So that actually even gives you a sense about the working nature of these texts, right? That these teachers are teaching their students using commentaries and generating their own commentaries on top of it, right? And, and as they work. And we'll see how that helps in developing medicine. He's from Kirman. He's a practicing physician. Makes his way to Samarkand at one point. Works for the Timurid Mongol ruler Uluq Beg, and is his personal physician and dedicates his commentaries to him. Uh, so again, pretty high up, uh, uh, and is trained in philosophy as well. As, uh, as actually, you're not going to see this one, but he is. Uh, trust me on that. Uh, Hakim Shah Ibn Mubarak is the last one I'm going to look at. He's 1521, so we've already seen developments all the way for 300 years, and these texts are all known to him. He's originally from Qazwin, makes his way to Shiraz, either he or his parents, it's unclear whom, right? Works under a major philosopher in Shiraz called Dawani. He's a student. We know about this in, in many, many ways. Uh, another student of Dawani is a guy called Muayyad Zadeh, who is high up. He's an admiral in the army of the Ottoman rulers in Constantinople. Uh, right? And uh, Muayyad Zadeh basically invites Hakim Shah to come there. Right? And so Hakim Shah makes his way over there and then serves the next three Ottoman rulers, Bayezid, uh, Salim, and then Suleiman the Magnificent. Right? Uh, what's fascinating is that over the course of that time, he writes, of course, many works, including his commentary on the epitome, but he's also, as you see, physician, philosopher, theologian, and a Quranic exegete. Right? Uh, he writes a commentary on the epitome, which we can date exactly to 1519, thanks to an autograph copy. Right? So I have, I have access to this manuscript, which is basically his rough draft. Uh, right? It's not the finished copy. It's a working copy when you would know, cross out and then he's writing in and he realizes, oh, he's missed something, goes back and inserts it, and various kinds of things. It's really fascinating. And then it says, where the red line goes through, that it was finished in the hand of the author. And he gives a date. And it carries no dedication, because of course it's not the final copy. And the date dates to Salim's rule. Salim is still alive. But then the rule changes to Suleiman. And so the other copies of this manuscript that exist carry a dedication to Suleiman. So he basically then dedicated it to Suleiman and, and, and continued on with his, with his life. Or however it was. That may have been. So those are the commentaries I'm looking at. Uh, just to give you a quick whirlwind tour, some of the things that come through, rulers are involved. Many of these people are practicing physicians. They're very well skilled in philosophy. So if the commentaries include any new developments, you'd expect them there, right? Both in terms of the practice coming in and as well as the philosophical uh, developments going through. And all of them know Ibn Nafis. He's cited galore across these texts, right? So the idea that Ibn Nafis was never picked up, eh, not true. Um, right, he's all over the place, and I'll show you in terms of uh, the content, how that comes through. Um, finally, I think just looking at those red lines and, and movements of the text and the fact that you've got southern Anatolia and the text is showing up in Herat in Afghanistan and people in Kirman and all these people are reading, just look, look at the vast nature of that movement and it's over land mass, it's not even over uh, uh, ships, right, and, and sea, which is of course faster travel. Um, that will be important later on. All right, so I'll give you three examples of developments. Right. One is pulse. This is the classic Galenic one, which is there in Fakhreddin al-Razi. Right. He's very clear about it. He goes, pulse is a movement or emotion in the category of place. I'll come back and discuss that shortly, so we'll bracket that part out for the time being. Of the receptacles of the spirit issued from the vital faculty is composed of expansion and contraction in order to temper the spirit with fresh air. What the heck does that mean? It means the following, 
Um, as far as Galen and the people following in that trajectory were concerned, the heart was really part of the kind of spirit or pneumatic organ, right? Breath makes its way in, that's kind of important for life, it's cultivated or uh, done up in the heart, and then it vivifies the rest of the body through it, right? So the heart was part of that physiological system. The arteries and the heart are then, the left side of the heart, are actually what are called receptacles of the spirit then, because you know, the, they're conveying the spirit, and of course wastes are then put out, it's you know, a two-way movement, it's not a single way. And so pulse was seen not just as the movement of the arteries, but pulse was kind of like, oh, it's both, right? Maybe it's the heart and the arteries, or you know, that, that's the kind of confusion that remains. And then it's also the idea, well, what about the brain? Is that pulse? And there were some people who claimed that it did, and some people that claimed that it did not, right? So the receptacle to the spirit shows very clearly Fahladin and Arazi is still in this older mindset debating in the Galenic kind of stuff, right? Uh, composed of expansion and contraction, issued from the vital faculties. So the other crucial part about Galen, he has this massive text where he wants to go against earlier people who had claimed, such as um, Aristotelus, uh, that the pulse was because of a push. Right? That the idea that the heart contracts, it forces things out into the arteries, and that's why the arteries are pulsing. And Galen, Galen, the anatomist, you know, he said, no, 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 that's not true. He says what it is, is it's something called the vital faculty. It's a power that's communicated from the heart to the arteries through their coverings. Right? And so they pulse that way. And as far as in terms of whether it's simultaneous or together, if I'm not mistaken, although uh, uh, Alan can correct me, it's simultaneous uh, for Galen, right? that the uh, heart expands and the arteries expand and the arteries contract and the heart contracts. And that's what he has, Bapa Dina Razi, pretty much that, right? That it's to balance the spirit. When you move into Ibn Nafis, and this is, I'm not going to go about Al-Samari, I said that's my control, you know, the idea is that that continues to be the case. When you get to Ibn Nafis, he's like, well, scholars all agree that the motive cause of pulse is the vital faculty, but we disagree with them on that, and we shall show in what follows that it is actually the volitional faculty. Now, it's going to be a very awkward understanding of volitional faculty, but when you see volitional here, think involuntary. That really is what's going on, and we'll see it in a later passage. Oh, sorry. And he says, note that the meaning of pulse in our time is the motion of the arteries without that of the heart. There's your other development. Right? The heart has now been removed. The pulse is purely the movement of the arteries, uh, and not that of the heart. And he goes, it's a positional motion, and I'll come back to that, composed of a forced contraction caused by the expansion of the heart and a natural expansion coinciding with the heart's contraction. And that's where we get the clear, I mean, there's a larger passage of, of excised it out, but this, this captures it. For Ibn Nafis, the heart expands, sucks the spirit back into the heart, that makes the arteries contract. And then the heart contracts, kind of returns back to its contracted state and naturally, and the arteries return back to their natural expanded state. It's the opposite of both Aristotelus and how we usually conceive of it, right? But that's important to recognize, because we'll see it shortly. Uh, 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 um, so, and uh, again, just to uh, confirm that again, the active, the active motion of the arteries is their contraction caused by the expansion of the heart, right? The flip side of the way we think about it. Later people, Qutbuddin al-Shirazi, just to give you a sense that it shows up, there it is, right? And Qutbuddin al-Shirazi says, actually, there are six ways of thinking about the pulse, right? And he lists six, and he goes, the sixth one is what Al-Qurashi says which is that the heart is a volitional motion, involuntary motion, remember I told you to kind of retranslate that, and that the arterial expansion is natural and the contraction is forced. Exactly what I said, the heart expands, the arteries contract, right? And that they're out of sync, they don't happen together, right? So these are claims. And you see, Kutbuddin Shazi, he rejects Ibn Nafis, he doesn't go with him, right? But he recognizes that, yeah, Ibn Nafis has done something new, and that's good enough uh, for our purposes. That's the manuscript that I've just mentioned to you, the Aksarai manuscript, right? Resolution of the epitome. There's the marginalia, insertion by al kiramani students saying, right here, Min Maulana Nafis, from our teacher, our Lord Nafis. Nafis Kiramani, not Ibn Nafis, right? Uh, where they've inserted it, right? Saying, oh, our teacher actually added this onto it. So what Aksarai does, Aksarai does not name the various teachings. He just stops after a discussion of positional motion, which I'm going to get to uh, uh, right after this, right? Uh, and so Kirmani added onto that, and he said, actually, 
and here it is in translation, excised a bit, right? There's a disagreement over whether the movement of the arteries follows the motion of the heart or not. Galen and those who follow him believe that the movement does not follow the motion of the heart, but rather is due to a faculty, the vital faculty of the arteries. Then they disagree with this faculty, and some say that it is a vital, vital faculty, so now he's going to talk about, you know, even within that, there are some changes that have taken place. He goes, many of the ancients say that its contraction is with the expansion of the heart, and its expansion, the artery's expansion, with the contraction of the heart, and this has been chosen by the author, Ibn Nafis. Right? And that's the one subsequently Kermani's going to go with. Right? He even comes out and he says, yeah, pulse in our time means the motion of the arteries, not the heart. Right? So there are further corrections that he makes. It. And just to show that that continues on, Hakim Shah al-Khazwini, sitting in Constantinople, writing in 1519, says the same thing. Some claim that the expansion of the arteries along with the expansion of the heart and the contraction with the contraction, if we go all the way down, right, he goes, uh, uh, others claim that the contraction of the artery is with the expansion of the heart. This is the teaching of many ancients. From amongst them, there are those that claim that the movement of the heart is volitional, to which the author inclines. Involuntary, remember, to which Ibn Nafis inclines. This is because the heart possesses sense and the movement of the pulse follows the heart, and so on. Uh, and of course, then Al Qazwini goes on to defend how he can make that claim, right? That it's a volitional motion, and he says, well, it's just like the eyelids, right? Uh, which is their category is still volitional, and that's what I'm saying. Translate to involuntary for us. Okay, um, this one I'm going to go quicker over, but just to give you a sense of the philosophy behind this, right? I'm not going to read the passages; I'll just leave them up there. Um, <coughs> For modern cosmology, even, right, if you try to think about, uh, if you have ever tried to think about it, we always hear about space expanding. Expanding into what? The balloon example doesn't work, because the balloon is expanding into something else we call space. Right? The concept of space itself expanding is a bit mind-blowing. Uh, to try to think about it, and we can't really come up with good analogies. Now, in the Aristotelian universe, the Earth-centered uh, external final sphere, the celestial sphere where all the stars are dotted, right, and those are moving, in the Aristotelian universe, that was the limit of place as well. There was nothing outside that sphere, right? But of course, that sphere for Aristotle was rotating. Rotating with respect to what? There's nothing outside it, right? Now, Aristotle really struggled with this, and he said, well, it's still doing it in, so he said it's rotating, and rotational motion, he says, was a kind of locomotion, right? Category of motion in place. And there's a lot of debate about it, and people challenge him, etc. And Avicenna, the great thinker that he was, came out and says, no, Aristotle's wrong about this. There's actually a fourth category of change, right? There's quality change, there's a change in quantity, there is a change with respect to place, local motion, and he goes, there is rotational motion, what he calls category of position, right? Change only with respect to positions, not with respect to the place they occupy. Ibn Nafis applies that category and he says, the arterial pulsing is exactly that, which is like, what are you talking about? That makes no sense. But he goes, hear me out. Right? The arteries are contiguous. They're touching whatever else is next to them. So he goes, they're never displaced. They continue to touch them when they expand or they contract. So because they're never displaced, they're still in place. So they haven't moved with regards to place. So their motion must be similar to a circle rotating. Right? That's, that's his argument in a nutshell. And that drives a lot of people up the wall. Uh, a Shirazi is like, but wait, I feel it. Clearly, I couldn't feel it. Now I feel it. Something's happened, right? And so he goes, well, yeah, so he says this. And Shirazi starts working with this. Now, the other problem that they're having is that their concept, their term for place is mekan. Mekan means, you know, it can also come to mean, for example, a house. It basically means the space that you occupy, right? Uh, and that's what he's saying. He goes, well, you're contiguous. You're touching something. You're occupying this. You never got displaced. And so that's where Shirazi starts to play with the idea, OK, can we think about another way to conceptualize space or place, right? And we talk about whereabouts. Where is something, right, kind of, with, as opposed to what is it next, what is it touching? And the reason he says that, and he goes through with it, he goes, well, when I pick up a cup of water and move it, are you telling me that the water has not moved with respect to place? Clearly it has. It's no longer in the same place. But under Ibn Nafis, that would be, yeah, it hasn't moved because it's still touching the cup, 
right, in, in, in that way. So that's what they're kind of boggled by. And Aksarai says it very nicely. He goes, in a category of place, the moon object must change its whereabouts, not that it must be displaced from what it's touching. And that's why he says, water in a cup, right? Transfer from one house to another. Clearly, it's moved in place, uh, in, in the category of place, right? Uh, and then he says another one. He goes, well, expansion and contraction really is kind of a movement away from the center is expansion. A movement towards the center is contraction. So if we're all in a circle, we take a step back. The circle expands. We take a step forward. The circle contracts. He goes, clearly the expanded circle and the closed circle cannot occupy the same place. He's like, this is stupid. Why are we even arguing about this, right? So he goes, even if he says wrong, it's movement in the category of place. Arterial motion is like that. And then you get this guy at Bilbobotic. He goes, wait a minute, right? Uh, you're raising this objection with regards to that. But notice the motion of the water with respect and if I pick this bottle of water up and move it here, he goes, the water has not moved by, the water is not the one that's moved, it's a bottle that's moved. Right? So he makes a distinction with what he calls per accident and per se motion. So he goes, if you're going to talk about per se motion, the water actually has not moved with regards to the place. But per accident, it has. It's just like you know, me on the ship, and the ship is moving. Right? And then he brings into another category. He goes, we need to talk about metaphorical space and real space. Real space is what it is touching. Metaphorical is kind of this God's eye view, right? So you start to see they're really starting to deal with some really important concepts in physics and, and philosophy that have a major uh, repercussions later on as well. So this is just my taste to give you a sense that the medical texts are very philosophically astute, right? The final example is humoral theory, right? Uh, and my reason for doing that too is just to give you a sense that whether the arteries are a kind of rotational motion or a kind of local motion has no bearing medically. That is not even an argument about how pulse matters in terms of determining diagnoses or any of the or prognoses or whatever it is, right? So, but they're willing to engage in that discussion because it's all about intellectual refinement. It's about being astute, and there are probably larger issues going on which are making their way into the medical text, right? So, if they can get deeply engrossed in that argument in philosophy, what about humoral theory, which is of course directly relevant? kinds of elements in medicine, and that's what I'm going to go into now. Uh, I'm going to breeze through some of it. Again, the quotes are there just in terms of the idea that there is evidence behind this. Um, the Galenic understanding of how humors are produced are the following. You eat food, it gets kind of mildly digested in the mouth, makes its way into the stomach where it's digested more, uh, makes its way into the intestines and then the livers, and then the liver is where the humors are produced. Right? Now, as far as Galen was concerned, all of this movement was because everything attracts food to itself because it nourishes itself with it. And the wastes are kind of expelled out. Even in the piece says, well, that's a problem. Because if the humors are supposed to be the ones that are doing the actual nourishing, then the stomach should not be getting food and getting nourished by it. And that's where you introduce, again, the concept of natural volitional. That's why I said, notice the involuntary part. Right, that's our kind of And he's very clear. He goes, anything that has fibers is some kind of volitional motion or you know, some kind of motion that, uh, uh, in, in that category. Uh, and his three examples that he provides are womb, stomach, and heart. Right? He goes all through, and he even says the heart is kind of like an animal. Right? You can uh, uh, bring brings food to it much like that. Right? So that is an immediate rejection of what's going on in Galen. Right? That he goes through. Uh, similarly, according to Galen, the mesenteric veins, right, those that connect uh, uh, the, uh, go into uh, um, the intestines, uh, and the gastric veins that go into the stomach, right, as far as Galen was concerned, they went into the pit of the stomach, not on the surface, right. Ibn Afi says, no, they don't go into the pit of the stomach, right, they're actually on the surface. Anatomically, he's right about this. And so this is what makes me think he's looking at some sheep. Uh, intestines and the peritoneum cavity there, right? Uh, and it makes sense for him kind of physiologically because he talks about, well, if they go into the pit, then they're going to pick up stuff that they shouldn't be picking up, right? The kind of dregs and stuff which are supposed to be evacuated, right? So, uh, so that's his example. And then comes a final phrase. He goes, blood is the best of the humors because it is pure nutrition. The rest of the humors are like spices. Real nutrition is blood. 
which leads to another major issue, which is that while the sound humor is that whose property is to become a part of the substance of the nourished member on its own, such as blood, or with something other than it, such as phlegm, yellow, black bile, and black bile, for these become a part of the substance of the nourished member when they're mixed with the blood, but not on their own. Well, what does that mean? He basically says, well, every part of the body is slightly different in terms of texture and stuff, so that's what spices do, right? They change up the texture, they change up the taste, they do those sorts of things. And he goes, so they're really not there for the nourishing quality. The nourishing quality is blood. It just needs to be changed up to resemble the, the member it needs to make its way in. And yellow bile itself cannot nourish anything. Why is that important? Well, because according to Galen, that's why the gallbladder gets yellow bile. Right? It brings itself to it because it's doing that. And even if he says no, the gallbladder is not nourished by yellow bile. Right? It actually sent, the yellow bile is sent down just as a storehouse. And so then the yellow bile, what it does is that it can be excreted out from the gallbladder to remove the sticky phlegm and various other kinds of things through the linings and, and to pass it out as stool. Right? And that's what he says in this passage. And then he has a final one where he says, humors are all produced by the same in AT. I'm not actually going to touch on that. That's just, again, a few other things that he's changing up. Uh, again, these are just examples that this is picked up. Shirazi says the same phrase from Ibn Nafis, just plops it in. And he says, the sound humor is that which becomes a part of the substance of the nourished member on its own, such as blood, which becomes a part of the flesh, and so forth. But, this is crucial, Shirazi is not going to go all the way with Ibn Nafis, and he actually hates Ibn Nafis. There's a larger issue about that. I can talk to you about it. Otherwise, right? Uh, and so what does he do? He says blood is the best of the humors because it is the source, the real part of the uh, nourishment. The rest of it is like spices. And he says, this is what Avicenna says in his book of healing. Avicenna never says it, right? So Chodotina Shirazi is doing this for completely different reasons, right? So I've talked about how great some of the stuff can be. This also gives you a sense of some nefarious things that are going on that can be picked up. Again, this is just another example of someone else who's working through with what Ibn is doing but they don't actually go far enough because they think that Avicenna says something similar and they're not working through all the consequences. Aksara is a great example of that too. The final guy is Ibn Mubarak who does work through the consequences. And I'll just kind of leave it at that where he, so it's there in Constantinople at this time. To wrap up in terms of why some of this stuff is important for a larger picture too is what I'm gonna now quickly take five minutes to step back out. To say so, A, we've already, we've already challenged the idea that nothing's going on. So the idea is we need to go in and figure out what's going on. How does science work? It helps us larger to think about the relationship between medicine, philosophy, new developments in medicine, the relationship between theory and practice of medicine, how is this actually informing, if at all informing, practical medicine and so forth. Uh, just to give you a quick example, Harvey does circulation of blood in 1600s. It has almost minimal impact on the practice of medicine subsequently, right? Uh, because that all, I mean, there are various theories that keep going on and going on. Civil war, humoral theory is still being used, right, uh, in the US Civil War, just to give you a perspective on that. So that's important in its own right, but this is how it changes the Renaissance picture, right? I'm going to give you two quick examples of people. Andre Alpega, who died 1521, made his way to Damascus from the Veneto, and then made his way back out to Venice after staying 19, 20 year, uh, years there learned Arabic, translated the Avicenna and Canon of Medicine again, right? revised translation of various many things. Another guy, Moses Galliano, he's in the same court as Ibn Mubarak in Bayezid's court, right? And, he's an, uh, and he works, he goes between Venice and Constantinople, and then is in Candia, where he sells a lot of Arabic and Hebrew manuscripts to Renaissance collectors, who are directly connected with some physicians in the Renaissance period, right? Uh, just two examples of much larger movements that are taking place. And of course, the region in which this is taking place is significantly shorter and smaller than the, the region that we just saw the movements in. Right? How does this impact? Well, these are some Renaissance discussions and examples. This is Andrea Alpega's text, which is published posthumously. He died in 1521. This is published later, which contains, this is a fascinating part, Ibn Nafis' text on the fifth volume of the canon, his commentary. But that's actually not the one I'm most interested in. I'm most interested in the one that is actually above it, which says Shirazi, philosopher and physician, and his commentary on the second part, third part, and fourth part of the first book of the canon. And the reason I'm interested in that is because Shirazi, we just encountered, talked about the six teachings of Pulse. They're right here in this translated version, right? And because in the Renaissance medical discussions, there is no equivalent of discussing positionality of motion and the definitions of motion, 
the translation has excised the first five considerations in which Shirazi makes those discussions and just goes straight to the sixth one, which is all about the teachings of Paul's. Right? What happens? It's right here, very clearly, Shirazi in the Latin translation is saying the same thing, that everyone has claimed that the motive you know, uh, force for uh, Paul's is the vital faculty except Al-Qurashi. Right, who says that it is actually the volitional faculty, and then Alpego has a marginalia that says Al Qurashi is a commentator on Avicenna, and he's actually known by Ibn Nafis. Right, so he's going ahead and clarifying that directly. Why why that's important is because, as Alan and many others can can point out, uh, Paul's discussions are massive in Renaissance Italy. Right, and this is an example of Gabriel Fallopio, who died in 1562. He's actually a Galenist. He's attacking others. But notice what he says. When the arteries are moved, they're moved accidentally. And the heart is contracted, the arteries are dilated. But when the heart is dilated, the arteries collapse as the blood is recalled to the heart. That is the essence of Ibn Nafisa's theory. That is not Aristotle's, right? Uh, or the ancient Greeks. Where is this coming from? Right, is, is, is the real thing. And so that's the part to kind of work through. Colombo, of course, is a, is a great example of someone who did perform vivisections and everything. But it's also very well known that he made this galling error, uh, that he referred to the expansion of the heart as the systole. Right? Elementary Latin mistake, sure. But I would actually argue that's because he took systole not to mean necessarily contraction, but active. And so the active nature of the heart is its expansion, which results in the contraction of the arteries. That's exactly the Nafisa theory. And that's what it's in dialogue with, right? Uh, and, and where that comes from. Um, for now, is the uh, interesting example where a lot of stuff shows up from Ibn Nafis and generation theory and many other kinds of things. But here are the examples from humoral theory. Yellow bile and black bile are less suitable for nourishing the body, and consequently, it is inappropriate to mix them with blood, the pure nutriment of the body, the exact phrase that shows up. Nature separates them, gathers and stores yellow bile in the bladder, and, and the other one in the spleen. He goes, you know, corrosive and bitter though this humor is, it is neither unpleasant nor harmful. Gallbladder acquires enjoyment and a pleasant feeling, but it is not nourished by it. Fundamental principle of Ibn Nafisa's reworking of humoral theory. Uh, similarly, he goes, For my part, I hold that both coats of the stomach alike are nourished by blood. No, do not refer to the feeding from chyle in which the stomach engages as true nutrition. Again, the exact part of Ibn Nafis in terms of how this is working. And of course, Fernell also goes in and says the gastric veins do not enter into the pit of the stomach, they just come onto the surface. He right? says the same thing with the mesentery. So a lot of work for us to do in terms of really thinking through the engagements and developments in this period, and also kind of this dialogue between the Latin world and the Islamic world, which is clearly taking place, but the details of it are not quite there yet. And there are many more examples, but I'll stop here. Thanks. Any questions from anybody who asked questions? Anybody? If you can't think of one, I've got plenty, so that's from my Think think for a second, I'm gonna ask one. Okay, um, so I wonder if you have a sense of the, the reason for writing this commentary. So if you look at uh, the Latin tradition, for example, the Pedanes are often influenced for students, the big commentaries for you know, other deeper thinkers. Is there any sense of, of you know, I mean Obviously, you have lots of schools going on here and lots of student teacher relationships. So, oh. yeah, no, that's actually a good one. The epitome, um, so two commentators in the epitome make it abundantly clear who they're writing it for. Right? The, uh, the, the first two, Kazaluni says very clearly that the epitome has become the kind of reference tool for students. Mm -hmm. Right? So, when he's writing the commentary, he's writing it for those students and practicing physicians. And Aksai says the same thing. He's writing it for, for students and the kind of new practicing physicians. They recognize that because the text is so short, it's easy to use. Now, they both use terms which are fascinating, right? Kazaruni says it's the ultimate commentary because he's like, it frees the practicing physician from consulting other works when he's working. So that's what the book is written for. 
And it's very clear in Kazaruni that he gives a lot of kind of practical things which are missing in Aksaray. I think Aksaray is more student related that goes really, uh, sorry, sorry, I think earlier I mentioned Aksaray might have been a practicing position. It's for students, right, Aksaray. And it's called the resolution of the epitome. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because it's to resolve outstanding issues, which is a very student teacher kind of thing that he wants to do. Um, and he's not a practicing physician. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, he writes it on all the entire uh, abridgment, which of course includes galore practical sections. I'm not really sure what the heck he's going to have to say on, on, on many of those issues, right? Because I think in many cases he's just cutting and pasting stuff that he can find in an NFP, because he's not going to be able to bring anything of his own. Now, this is not to say that Kazaruni is necessarily bringing stuff of his own either, right? But, uh, uh, but at the very least, he's going to pitch it in a way that it's accessible to a practicing physician just as much to the others. Um, now, in terms of why the heck Ibn Nafis is writing, he has all kinds of interesting phrases. I think he is writing for a much larger audience. Uh, and it's also based on trying to get, I mean, commentaries are written for those purposes, but they're also sh written to show mastery over material by kind of a very master scholar. Right? So Ibn Nafis can do this. Right? No one else can. Right? To, to write. It is. Uh, and it's written very early, uh, right? which in some ways goes against that, because he's writing it very early in his career. Uh, right? 12, 1242 is our first manuscript of the commentary on the anatomy, which is, exists in the UCLA um, library. Right? Um, it's 1242 when he's like 32 years of age. And he's written the commentary in the anatomical sections entirely already. Which means, based on that, that he's written the commentary on book one already. Right? Uh, subsequent works, which we can reliably date from 1270s, contain references to the commentary in the canon. So between sometime in the 1240s and later he's written, and I think he's actually written them very quickly in, in the 1240s, kind of one after another. Uh, uh, is, is, is what he's done. Uh, but they are a reputation builder, uh, and they work. Because uh, subsequently, uh, he is known as the person who introduced the people in Egypt to Avicenna. That it was after him that ev everyone goes to Avicenna's canon of medicine. It's exaggerated. That's not entirely true. But I think any engagement with Avicenna's canon of medicine after Ibn Nafis cannot take place without him. Right? There's a reason why Kutub al Shirazi, who cannot stand him, quotes him all the time. Right? Uh, and, and disputes him all the time. So basically, someone like Alpego showing up, he's hearing Ibn Nafis' name left and right, right, because everyone's engaging with him. Um, you know, the, the Shirazi, uh, I think, is, is writing it to resolve kind of issues, um, you know, the kind of patronage politics that are part of it, too. Uh, student relations, Kermani is very clear. He's teaching the uh, abridgment to students using Aksai's resolution and then adding a Right, and that's how he's generating his commentary. Mubarak, Ibn Mubarak, I think, is in the vein, sort of, of Kazaruni, where he's like, I'm going to free you, because he says very clearly in the beginning, he's consulted every single commentary in the epitome ever written. Uh, and it makes sense, because he's in Constantinople, with the Ottoman Empire, you know, having just about 50 years ago found its feet again, right, after the whole Timurid collapse has taken place, and, and they, they've taken over Constantinople. They clearly are not a big, great thing. Um, you know, he's in their courts, and uh, the Ottomans are very concerned with bringing stuff to them. And he's going to turn around and say, here, I'm going to produce for you a definitive commentary on the epitome that examines all preceding commentaries on the epitome, right? Uh, uh, and includes kind of practical and teaching and various other kinds of things. So I think there are many, many motivations for writing it. What's we got? I have a question. Um, your images that you showed of some of the original works are, are really very compelling. And you talked about being able to go to California to see you know, some of the original things. How accessible are some of these items for you and for other scholars? Now, uh, as a colleague of mine at Berkeley, Asad Ahmed says it, right? He has this really nice phrase in, uh, in one of his articles. Uh, uh, he works on post this period philosophy, right? In fact, he even goes beyond until about 1800 or so. Uh, he, he calls it the post-classical period, as, as do many other people, right? And uh, the standard claim in philosophy has been the same. Oh, after Averroes, there's no philosophy in the Islamic world, right? Absolutely bogus. If you want a very quick uh, version of it, 
History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps, the podcast by Peter Adamson, is phenomenal. Right, and totally go to it, and he does a brilliant job of, of providing you with all the kind of stuff that happened after. Um, and he has this great phrase where he says, you know, it's not because of accessibility. Because he says they've been sitting, you know, in the dozens in libraries across the world, easily accessible, just collecting dust. For someone to just come and open them up. But no one's bothering to open them up because the larger question that they have is, of course, they could not have been anything. Because if there was anything, Harvey would have been an Arab or a Persian or a Turkish, whatever you want to say. That, right? His name would have been Muslim something, uh, right? And that has been that has been the major problem. I mean, my first book is on Ibn Nafis and contextualizes and shows new developments in Pulse. So for example, before I went in and said he had a new theory of Pulse, no one really had done it. This neat piece by O'Malley, where he used the Latin version of that text that I just showed you, and says someone's engaging in some anti galenic speculation on Pulse, but I'm not really sure what's going on. Now, it's not his fault because he's reading Shirazi's commentary, which quotes chunks of Ibn Nafis, and he disagrees with it. So, no doubt, O'Malley was just confused as to what the heck is going on in this text, right? Um, but I mean, if he's original, it was available to anyone to go in and open it up. Right? It's the most widely available commentary on the canon. Um, right. And he's not as verbose as Shirazi, which would make it harder to pinpoint. Right? I mean, for my first book, all that literally, and in fact, even now, it, all I have to do is open up the page, and I said, it says right here. Right? So when Meyerhoff turned around and said there was no physiological investigation behind this anatomical theory, it was not because he went and opened up book one, where all the physiology is, to show what's going on. Right? And again, this has something to do with their understanding of physiology as an experimental science, which in itself comes into existence at the end of the 1800s, or middle, somewhere around there. And Alan would be better off, or other people may know the exact phrasing, but just around that time. I mean, Bernard and, and, and others at the turn of the century and, and stuff are, 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 are the figures to think through there, and of course, uh, with precedence in the 19th century. Uh, but before that, physiology is really like philosophy. It's kind of a discourse, right, an examination. It means it's, it's still invested in empirical observations. Right? For a pulse, for example, I didn't say something, uh, which is really, really neat as far as I'm concerned. Ibn Nafis, you know, the idea that the, he says, well, so the heart expands and it sucks back this thing. So he thinks through this and he does a classic scholastic method. And in scholastic method, it would be like, he goes, and you may object that if that were the case, then the arteries would contract differently based on their distance from the heart. He's thinking it through. And Ibn Nafis goes, you are right. They do. But we cannot notice that because it takes place so quickly. And of course, in that way, you can turn around and say, that sounds reasonable, right? If, what, you've got 80 beats per, per minute, right? In the absence of earlier kind of, how the heck are you going to gauge? What part of the artery is contracting and expanding, you know, based on the distance. It's, it's going to be harder to do on a living person to begin with, right? Uh, and he says it, he goes, I haven't, and he says, a definitive proof for my theory will come if you cut open a live animal. And he says, I have not done that. And then he actually says it. He goes, I am not going to do that, right? It kind of goes against my morals and ethics to do it. And of course, it's exactly the experiment that Columbo then does to, to, to prove uh, the theory. But he knows it. He goes, that's all you need to do. Uh, so I think it's, it's this lack of that. These manuscripts are galore. Right, uh, the uh, autograph copy that I just showed of Hakim Shah that's sitting in Berlin, Staatsbibliothek. Um, the massive commentary that I talked about, the 27 lines and stuff, it's been sing sitting in the Welcome Library of Medicine in London, very easily accessible to literally anyone walking up, uh, and can, can request it and have a look at it. The British Library has copies of Ibn Nafis's commentary. Um, the abridgment commentaries, the epitome commentaries, were actually edited and lithographed in the 19th century. So you actually can get it on the interlibrary loan from a few places too. Right? So it's, they're all there to, to examine. It just requires the will. And of course the Arabic to, to be able to read it. But many of the people have had that Arabic and but not had the will to, to go in. What else do we have? Anybody? Oh, well, thank you again. That was really interesting.